Uh, today we're talking about some of the foremost algorithms of uh, bioinformatics. I, I think it would be really hard to name any algorithm more central to what people think of as bioinformatics than BLAST. So I'm glad we got a chance to work with it this morning. This afternoon we're going to try to understand it, and that is kind of a different kettle of fish. So how can we sequence, assemble, and annotate a novel genome? It's a very, a very daunting task. And correspondingly, I'll be talking about a whole bunch of different algorithms along the way. We will have some discussion of arachne, uh, as well as a discussion of KMERS. KMERS is a concept that shows up whenever you talk about assembly in uh, genomic annotation, so we're going to try to meet that head on. Uh, we'll talk about the relationship of paired end sequencing to the ability to assemble genome from, uh, from this. We'll talk about the problems of how we go about gene finding. How do you find the interesting bits of DNA? So gene finding. Along the way, there's going to be plenty of discussion of aligning sequences. So what are the algorithms that we might use for optimal alignment via dynamic, dynamic programming? And how do the heuristics and, and substitution matrices play into this problem of alignment? Alignment is a very, very key concept. You will find a lot of universities where an entire semester-long course focuses on just the alignment of sequences. That is not this course, however. Today you get it all in two hours, so uh, we'll see how that goes. We will also talk about the, the benefit of multiple sequence alignment, though just very briefly. From there, we will talk about recognizing motifs. These are little patches of sequence known to be attributed with particular structures or particular functions. So uh, we'll talk about uh, Interpro, most particularly, in evaluating uh, these conserved bits of sequence that we find across all kinds of different species. So uh, I brought us back to this diagram. I first showed this to you yesterday afternoon. And today, we are going to come down this left leg. So how do we deal with shotgun high throughput sequencing data to get to an annotated genome? So, Yesterday we were talking about the, the measurement of genetic variation and trying to attribute function to it. Today is about trying to look through this great mass of sequence and come up with answers about what the important bits are. So let us imagine that we have all of the human genome on one disk, but we don't have any annotation. It's just a really, really huge series of A's, C's, G's, and T's. It's a really long string, really. Several strings because we have different chromosomes, of course. Some parts of it are high in information content. Some parts of it are in very low information content. So it might be that you have a few thousand repeats of AT, for example. Something like that has relatively low information content. One way that you could think about this is how well could I squeeze this sequence if I were using a compression? Right? If you have a few thousand repeats of AT, you can certainly squeeze those down very, very aggressively. However, if you have a bunch of sequence that codes for a protein sequence, it's not going to be as repetitive as that. So how can we find these, these places within the genome that we call genes? Gene, by the way, is one of the very worst defined terms in all of bioinformatics. What exactly constitutes a gene? More or less, geneticists say it, it, it describes a region of interest, which is not very descriptive. So when I say gene, I frequently am implying a protein coding gene, which is definitive structure, right? You know, we have our introns, we have our exons, we have places where uh, uh, we, have a, we have a promoter, we have enhancers, stuff like that. That's a gene to me. But gene doesn't have to mean that. Gene can means something much, much looser. Just and This is an area, we're going to call it a gene, that relates to X, right? So we'll, we'll find that this definition dances around a fair bit. So in the context of today, when I say gene, I'm usually talking about a protein coding region. All right. Now let us start with paired end sequencing. Paired end sequencing is one of the most dominant methods that we see in how people conduct sequencing experiments. The idea being that rather than produce a bunch of hundred nucleotide stretches scattered randomly throughout the, the genome, it's valuable if you know that certain pairs of sequences relate to each other. So if, if you might imagine this as a, uh, you know, a, a 15 kilodalton, uh, sorry, not kilodalton, 15 uh, kilobase stretch of DNA, I have a little bit of sequence that I'm going to produce at this end, 
And in an associated experiment, one that the sequencer knows, I'm actually going to get a bit of sequence off of each end of that DNA. And that is hugely powerful. When we, when we think about this in the context of the sequence, you, you might start with a double-stranded DNA template, and now you have, you have uh, you've melted that DNA, so these strands have been separated from each other. You have some vector uh, that is on either end of this insert sequence. This is just how you, uh, how you cloned out this DNA to get it ready for sequencing. And you can create a primer that anneals to this, the three prime end of this vector sequence and to uh, the other end of, of, of the, up to the three prime end of the complementary sequence. So these primers are not specific to the DNA that you're actually going to sequence. These primers are complementary to a bit of DNA that is known to you to be um, the adapters by which these sequences are presented to the, to the sequencer. So then, when the sequencer is doing its magic, when it's building these complementary strands in, it's starting from these primers. We take advantage of the fact that DNA polymerase will only start when it has a bit of DNA to which it can add itself. So these primers are positioned in known sequence, and the complementary sequences are built in the unknown region of sequence. So you can then imagine this insert has a patch of sequence here and a patch of sequence there. That might seem kind of nonsensical, but we're going to talk about why it's actually very useful in the next stage. Have we got a bug flying around in here? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I don't, I don't have a fly swat, I'm afraid. Okay. So, uh, a friend of mine uh, wrote a, a paper many years ago on the, what value these paired end, sequencers, uh, paired end sequences had. I was trying to find, several years ago when I made this slide in the first place, the, uh, the first paper that explained why paired end sequencing was so valuable. And I, I kept getting hits to this paper by Jared Roach, and I thought, well, I didn't know Jared was famous, but there you have it. Jared Roach was famous. He wrote this paper in which he, he creates this image of an insert, this, this uh, bit of DNA that's been presented to the sequencer as having kind of a dumbbell shape. You know, we have our, our weights on either end of our dumbbell. Right, so here we've got our patch of sequence over here and our patch of sequence over here. Those are shown in this diagram as the dark blue patches on either end of a light blue patch. So one of the things that should be apparent to you in glancing at this diagram is that those light blue inserts are of widely varying lengths. Okay, so the kit that you use to produce the insert sequences presented to the sequencer may produce a variety of insert lengths. So if you have a bit of sequence here and a bit of sequence here, they may actually be very close together in genomic space if you're on a short insert, or they may be relatively far apart if you have a long bit of insert sequence. That's valuable for you, to have this variety. Now we can start stacking up these reads that we have produced from either end of these, of these inserts. And we find that in many cases, we have regions that are contiguously covered. So this, this phrase, uh, this term contig comes from this. These reads intersect with each other in a way that overlaps to produce a longer stretch of sequence than any one read itself can be. If we have reads that are 100 nucleotides long, and they happen to share 50 nucleotides with another, uh, another uh, read, we can stitch those together, and now we have 150 nucleotides wide. If there's another read that matches the last, say, 50 nucleotides of the other, now we're up to 200 nucleotides long, just building from these smaller subunits. So I, I hope that part is absolutely clear, that reads are connected to each other by dint of the fact that they share overlapping sequences. However, the reads are well, these inserts, at least, are, are quite uniformly scattered, ideally, over the whole of the genome. Some places, you'll have a whole stack of reads, 15 deep, 20 deep, whatever, depending, and, and this is the, oops, the, well, I'll be a little dizzy at that part of this, it's gonna be okay. However, some parts are going to be very sparse by comparison, and there may be only one read or two reads, 
or there may even be zero reads in some parts of the genome. So when we think about all of these reads that overlap with each other, projected downward, we see that some regions are covered, but there are these little islands in between that by random chance have not been covered by any reads. So a contig can't go through that region anymore. We don't have any reading of sequence within that narrow gap, or wide gap, as the case may be. It really depends on how your luck spins out. So this is our deduced target sequence that represents the contigs that have been stitched together from reads. All right, now we're going to get to the paired end part right, right next door to this. I, I note that sequencers, by the way, are present all over South Africa. It, you, you might think, well, you've got to go to Beijing or to the United States or whatever, to Europe for that matter, to get sequencing done. But in fact, uh, at, at the last count, I found 14 different sequencers operating in nine different facilities in South Africa itself. We have one in the Central Analytical Facilities, for example. The Center for Proteomics and Genomics Research has sequencers. The University of the Western Cape has sequencers. These are everywhere. So being able to make sense of data sets like these is, is a very widely needed skill. Okay, now we're going to come back to the story about context, but I want to tell another story before we get there. And this is the fact that our DNA has a legacy of a mighty battle, a titanic battle within it. Around the time that we split from uh, other primates, there, there was something kind of new in the genome. And this was the presence of the, the retrotransposon and other things here. These are these are uh, elements of DNA that are able to create copies of themselves that inject themselves into the DNA at other locations. Transposons. There are also lots of places where over time our DNA has started accumulating repeats. Maybe we had 100 to begin with of this AT, AT stretch and now it's suddenly much longer or there's CPG items for that matter. So, Repetitive DNA is a very common feature. Now, this paper from 2013, I think, is a really good overview of some of, the, the, some of these genetic elements that we have. So I'm calling all of this non-coding DNA. That's a bit of a garbage term, but it sort of covers all of this work. We have transposable elements, and we have variable number tandem repeats. Tandem repeats. So when you see the word tandem used in the context of genomics, it usually means that this single strand has multiple repeats falling within it. So uh, when I say AT, 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 I'm talking about one particular strand of, of, uh, of our genomes. Uh, we also sometimes talk about CPG islands. That's a case where you have a C nucleotide followed by a G nucleotide, and you can have many repeats of that as well. So these are examples of repeats that we see. So we have microsatellites and mini-satellites. Those are some of the terms that you'll hear for these regions that are filled with repeats. And short tandem repeats generally go, also go under the name microsatellites. I found that the, trying to untangle all the different synonyms that fall within the space was actually kind of daunting for me. All right, transposable elements fall into DNA transposons and retro transposons. Why would those be called retro transposons, do you think? Because it's, isn't it made from RNA? Very good, yeah. So we, we know of retro transcription. This is, this is an example of that. that is, this is an RNA template that is written into DNA from an RNA template. So that's, uh, that's interesting. So we find that there is a huge number of these retro transpo tra transposons throughout our DNA. They, in turn, can be separated into long interspersed repeat elements, which for some reason is called a line rather than a liar. We have short interspersed repeat elements that are called signs. We have long terminal repeats, and we even have long terminal repeats that have their very own endogenous retroviruses. Those are called ERVs. So this is quite the zoo of different things. And here's the really scary part. Some of these things are still alive within our genomes and they're making new copies of themselves. So the L1 uh, subset of the lines, every 108 births, we see an expansion of the number of lines present in the genome. So that's not completely inert. You know, in 100 generations, your line has an extra line thrown into it somewhere. 
And another one that we find piles of is this short interspersed repeat element of alu. So this is a primate specific sign. Um, it's called alu because there's a, a, a there's a um, a restriction enzyme that cuts DNA within this called alu. So we see that every 20 births, there's another alu shoved into our genomes. So these things are maybe quiescent. They're, they're, they're probably not spreading anywhere near as quickly as they did long ago, but they're still alive. Uh, and there are also composites that get built from some repeats and some sign elements, and those are still showing up maybe one in a thousand births. So our genome has a bunch of crap in it, and it also has some biologically active crap. We do not think of these retrotransposons as genes, per se, because they are not part of our business doing our thing being human. They're, they're effectively genomic infections. So we don't, as a rule, think of these as genes. And one of the things we would like to do when we're looking at our uh, our, our totality of DNA to, to assemble a genome is to not be fooled by the fact that sometimes you've got a gene that's close to a, 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 a one of these uh, one of these repeats or one of these uh, retrotransposons that might look accidentally like it's next to something else that's on that appears on the other side of another copy of that retrotransposon. So for that purpose we have created something called the Repeat Masker Algorithm. This was published many years ago, around the time of Fred and Frapp. But it's a, an approach that is frequently used. Essentially, someone has made a database showing existing, uh, existing sequences that are known for, for repeats or that are known for uh, transposable, transposable elements. They've created a database of what these sequences look like and then using something called Smith-Waterman, which we're going to get into a little bit later, not in very much depth, um, allows us to look for sequences that are not identical, but very, very similar to these, the, these signature repeats and, uh, re and retrotransposons. Okay? So having found these, uh, the software is, a, the, the, this rep base is, is the database of sequences uh, known to be associated with these repeats. So you feed repeat masker your genomic sequence, all these contigs that you've got, and the repeat masker will replace any region that has repeats with ends. Remember, we saw those when we were looking at a FASTQ file yesterday morning. The, those ends mean we don't know what this residue is. It just makes it basically a null sequence in there. So masking out the repeats is one of those things that we do in order to avoid getting fooled into thinking that we that something that's upstream of a repeat of this copy is not next door to one that happens to be downstream of such a repeat. We're going to emphasize that point again. So the danger of assembling a repeat is that you may, in somewhere in the genome, have a gene A and gene B that are separated by some repeat element, here called R. So A and B are separated by R. Somewhere else in the genome, we have a gene C and a gene D that are separated by another copy of that same repeat. If you only had a bit of sequence that stretched from A into R, and another bit of sequence that stretched from R into D, you might make the mistake of assembling these two together, such that A appeared to be close to D, even though that's not the reality. This is especially prone to happen if you have very short reads, as is common with modern sequencers. So, we have this problem that repeats may cause us to think things are adjacent that are truly not. Everyone good with that? That's why repeats are problematic when we get into problems of assembly. All right. Now, we've also expressed the problem that on occasion, we encounter a sequencing read that contains an error you may have an error in what the sequencer says the DNA should be at this point. And when you stack up all of these, uh, these sequences together, some of these become clear. Here, we had a, a sequencing read that had a missing base in this column. C, A, 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 and a miss here. So that's kind of problematic. We've got a disagreement in, in the sequences that are reporting a letter, and we've got a missing letter 
within this sequence. Here we have A, 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 missing letter A. In this case, it's probably safe to say the sequence, the sequence read that's missing that, that, that letter should have an A inserted at that place. But look at a space like this. Here we've got C, C, T, C, C. No letters missing whatsoever. But this, this middle sequence is, I'm oh, sorry, this middle sequence is arguing that the letter should be T, not C. It's, it's running afoul of those. So one of the things that we can do is vote it across these. So if we look at that stack, we look at the scores that are reported at each, at this position for all of those. C in this first sequence has a, a value of 20, second for 35, this dissenting T has a 30 score associated with it. C is 35, C is 40. Now, I'm going to ask you to decode what those scores mean. What does it mean to say that that C has a score of 20 in the first sequence? We talked about Fred scores yesterday. Score of 20. A score of 20 is 1%. Yeah. Uh, so. 1 in 100 is 10 to the negative second. We multiply that by negative 10 and we get 20. So yeah, the score of 20 means there's a 1% chance of error at that position. The second sequence, however, is much more definitive about it. It's saying 35. So e to the minus 3.5 is the, uh, it, sorry, 10 to the uh, minus 3.5 is the is the probability associated with this one. This T is pretty confident, isn't it? A T of 30 means that the sequencer has a 1 in 1,000 chance of error reported for this particular letter. 1 in 1,000. But this is one of the things that just keeps prop cropping up all over bioinformatics. We produce a lot of data. As a result, improbable things happen. Think of it this way. If you have a sequencer that is producing a 100, a 100 nucleotide read, if you, have, uh, if you had a uniform score across those of 30, how many errors would you expect to happen in a run of 100 letters by random chance alone? What's, what, well, how about this? What's the probability that all of those nucleotides are correct? That's a bit of a stumper, isn't it? The sequencer says all of these hundred letters have a one in a thousand chance of being wrong. So what is the probability that all of them are correct? Anyone know how to put that math together? Well, one way to think about it is that the only way that all of them are correct is that we have to take the other side of that probability. If there's a probability that any one of them has a one in a thousand shot of being wrong, we then need to look at the opposite of that. The probability that this one is right is 0.999. But it's not 0.99 for the whole sequence, it's 0.999 for this individual letter. So 0.999 raised to the hundredth power is the probability that all of them are correct. So if you have 10 such reads, 10 such reads, each at 100 in length, you have a total of how much, how, how many letters of sequence? 1,000. You have a hundred sequence, you have a hundred long read, and you have ten of them. So if that's true, you expect that one of those nucleotides is wrong by random chance alone across this 1,000 nucleotide stretch. So we produced a lot more than 1,000 letters in the sequencer, right? We produced millions of reads, millions of them. So these rare events, these, these cases where we estimated a one in a thousand chance of, of error are actually very, very frequent across the whole bulk of all of the reads we produced in the sequencer. So rare events do happen. When the data volume becomes very large, rare events happen with some sort of um, expected rate in effect. So, Something like a, 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 a T of 30 being wrong really does happen. In this case, the data for C outweigh the data for T. And one of the answers that this algorithm Arachne 
puts together, that's the Batsoglo uh, paper, is to argue that this, this letter should be error corrected. So what it does is to change this, this T to a C, but it does something that kind of crafty as well. It gives it a score, effectively it's, it's voting power, zero. So it's been outvoted, but it's not going to be used to boost the confidence that C is there. After all, this, this read had nothing to say in favor of C. Okay, so we've talked about repeats as a barrier to good assembly. We have talked about the, the possibility of outvoting a dissenting read. Finally, we're going to get to this topic of paired end sequencing. This is really the magic where paired ends come, to, come into play. We've changed how we visualize reads. So before we were looking at Jared's approach where a, a, an insert was shown in light blue with a patch of dark blue on either end that represented the sequenced patches. Here, we're showing that insert as an arc. See this arc right here? That is one insert sequence. And you see that we have a patch of read here on this end, and we have a patch of read over here on this end. Some amount of, some amount of contig discontinuity is going to happen. No matter high, how high you jack up that fold, uh, that, uh, the fold coverage that you're producing in your sequencer, there are always going to be some patches where you do not have sequence. We need some way to bridge across those. And paired end sequencing provides us that key. Here we see that this contig comprises all of these stacks of, of, of red sequence here. This contig represents a different patch in which we had contiguous reads. But we don't have any reads that fall, excuse me, that fall on this gap in between them. However, because we have paired end reads, we see that those arcs, those insert sequences, are held in orientation with each other by the fact that those two sequencing reads fall into neighboring contigs. We know that these contigs belong together near each other, maybe not how close together, but we know that they are near to each other because there are reads at either end of a single piece of DNA that sit in, in different contexts. Do people see that? I don't see it. Okay. We'll, we'll get another run. Um, I don't really have a good analogy for this one, I'm afraid, but... Let us imagine that I have my insert sequence here. I did a little bit of sequencing here, I got to read from that. I did a little bit of sequencing here, and I got to read from that. I did not have enough reads to build a solid contig all the way along this insert, all the way to the other end. I've got a hole there. There's no coverage at some point within this insert. But this read did pile up with other reads, and it runs, say, through here. This read did pile up with other reads, and it, you know, maybe, maybe it builds up to here and out. Now, I can't, I, I don't have any sequence to fill in the hole between those contigs. But I can at least say that these contigs must join each other. They must be next door neighbors to each other because there's one physical piece of DNA that connects the two together. Marissa. Maybe you could explain why the whole piece of DNA doesn't count towards assembling the thing. Okay, well certainly for this insert that I was just talking about, I didn't have reads all along its length. So but how do you know that it's one piece of DNA? Because the, 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 the sequencer kept track of which pieces of DNA led to which reads. Okay, so and, and then, but, um, maybe I missed that you explained it, but maybe you could explain why a read is then only so long. Well, today's sequencers sort of lose resolution at some point. You, you get up to a certain length of read. I mean, ideally, we would love to just sequence this whole piece of DNA. That would be great. But at the very least, it may be possible, in some cases, uh, depending on how you pick samples for the, uh, for the sequencer, to selectively sequence just that insert 
so you could shatter this one up into pieces and subject those to sequencing. That's a fairly expensive way to go, but it's, it's a, it was what we used to do gap closing when we did the genome project. Uh, Andreas had a comment as well. So, uh, in order to link the two, you need to have a lot of Sure, yeah, you, you don't want all the inserts to start and stop at similar locations. That's actually a very bad thing. We want some number of long inserts from which we're going to sequence things to capture, uh, to, to bridge across regions that are just filled with repeats, for example. That would be really bad. So being able to, uh, being able to infer this sequence at some point is something we definitely want to do. Uh, but we're not going to be able to do it from this initial sequencing experiment. But we can at least say that the contig that contains this read is near the contig that contains this other read. Good so far? Okay. That could, I, I could be clear on that point, I agree. Okay. Now this brings us to the fine, fine world of the k mer catalog. And from here, we start getting into things that are a little more computer science-y. The k mer catalog has a lot to do with that Burroughs-Wheeler uh, abstraction that we were talking about yesterday. A k mer catalog is the complete list of all, look, look, for now, let's stop calling it a, a k mer because that may not be helpful. Let's think of k as equal to 25, okay? So we want to be able to enumerate every 25 letter sequence that is represented anywhere in our sequencing read set. That sounds kind of painful, doesn't it? I mean, imagine if your, your reads are 100 nucleotides in length. They don't produce just four 25 mers, do they? Because it, I, this has now changed roles. This is no longer an insert. This is now just the read of 100 letters, okay? Our 100 letters can be separated into k-mers starting at the first nucleotide, the second nucleotide, the third nucleotide, the fourth nucleotide. So you can see that there's a large number, it's like 75 different k-mers that we can build from a single 100 nucleotide sequence. These are all called 25-mers, k-mers in this case, because I'm saying k-25, gesundheit, Megan. Yes. Hey, I got a name right, I'm feeling better. All right. So, these 25 MERS are subsections of reads that we've got. Ultimately, we want to be able to build some map that lets us step from one read to the next read to the next read and so on in navigating all the contiguous sequence that's available for, uh, to us. Making these contexts is a really hard thing to do efficiently. But the KMER catalog is one of our ways of accomplishing that. So, we want to create a sorted list, just to make this worse, of all 25 base pair sequences, along with their positions within reads. That sounds like a lot of work, but in fact, this is something that computers can do pretty well. One of the things that we can do is get a histogram of which, which K-mers, which 25 letter sequences, are most frequent, or in which ones are least frequent within this collection. Now, exclude high count k mers as repeats. Well, that's kind of a controversial point. We have these 25 letter sequences that are really, really common. They show up all over the place. So some of them are adapter sequences. We don't like those at all, because those adapter sequences tell us nothing about the biology of the organism in question. But some of them represent these signs and lines and VNTRs that we have throughout our genomes. So this is another way of dealing with those, to simply strip out all of them as uh, basically as repetitive DNA that is just going to confuse matters. So before we talked about screening out those sequences by marking them with a bunch of ends, here we see simply excluding those that show up very, very frequently. Okay. Overlapping reads will share k-mers Unless, well, what does that mean? What does it mean for overlapping reads to share k-mers? So we were saying that a read has many possible k-mers that can be derived from it. We had a 100 base pair read, 
and there were 75 different 25 residue, uh, 25 nucleotide sequences within it. The one starting at the first, the one starting at the second, the one starting at the third. If you have reads that overlap marginally, so let me, let me give the example of two reads that touch by, say, two nucleotides, right? Our ability to say that these overlap is very, very limited. In fact, it could easily happen by random chance that two reads are called intersecting if you only require two nucleotides to be shared by their ends, right? So that's a bad option. We don't want to go that route. We have to set, set some minimum criterion that we're going to require before we say that these two reads overlap. And at the moment, I'm calling it 25. Could it be 28? 28? Yes, it could be 28. But at the moment, we're simply going to say 25 represents our significant overlap between pairs of sequences. What is the probability that by random chance, two reads, random reads, would spontaneously have a match of 25 letters in, in a row? Mm, even the mathematician's going to sleep over there, I see it. <laughs> All right, well, I, this is actually a very, very low probability. You want, uh, let me see, a one in four event to happen 25 times over. I believe that would, maybe my math is wrong here, but let us say one in four raised to the 25th power. It's a small number. So the larger we set K, the less likely that two reads will mistakenly be told to over, uh, be claimed to overlap. The smaller that we set K, the greater the chance that a random overlap will take place. Now, if what, well, that, that logic would say, well, we need to set k really high. Maybe 25 is too lenient. Maybe we should turn it all the way up to 50, right? So that we require an overlap like this before we call these two guys uh, overlapping. The trouble here is that the more restrictive you are about claiming an overlap, the greater the chance that you erroneously say that two reads don't overlap when they really do. So there's this balance we have to strike. K too high means that we disallow some really some real overlaps from our data set. We reduce our ability to make sen sensible contacts. We set K too low, we start allowing random reads to uh, overlap when they really don't. That's a problem too. Okay, so the overlap must be, uh, if the overlap is less than K in length, two reads that really do overlap will be falsely called non-overlapping. And if you set K too high, you may find that base calling errors stand in the way of your calling these overlaps as well. There's some chance that these letters are wrong after all. So that is, this is the value of a K-MERS catalog. And if you thought that math was messy, you just wait. De Bruyne graphs. De Bruyne graphs are a very, very big deal. De Bruyne graphs, I find very vexing, frankly. And I'll tell you why. We want, we want to make contigs. We want to see all these reads that show up in this sensible bit of island of sequence, in this contig. We have a read here, we have reads there, we've got reads there, we've got reads all over, up and down this stretch. We just want to put them in order. We want to make contigs from these KMER libraries. But it's really kind of a hard thing to do. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to explain how these things work. Imagine that you have a K-mer that represents this point to this point. What K-mer would you possibly go to next to explain the next position, moving one nucleotide over? They're all 25 mers at this point. We have one at this point. We want to find the next one in sequence. Now, we're not going to jump all the way over to the next 25 mer that's just touching this one on the end. No, we, we want to go from this K-mer to one that's just one nucleotide to its right. You see that? So we have two 25 K-mers, a, a pair of 25 letter sequences, and we want to step to one that overlaps on this 25 mer by 24 letters. You see that? All right. The K-mer catalog is going to help us tremendously in this process because it's going to be pretty darn apparent pretty quickly 
that there's only one other 25 mer that's one step to the right. Ideally, I mean, that would be great, wouldn't it? So, this KMER library can be navigated in a couple of ways. Old school assemblers use something called a Hamiltonian cycle. A Hamiltonian cycle in order to navigate this great big mess of KMERs and figure out the best path through them to get a long contact. A Hamiltonian cycle. Hamiltonian cycles, however, are a serious pain to navigate. And some folks put some time and thought into this and decided a De Bruyne graph approach that looks for Wehlerian cycles. I know it looks like Euler. If you, if you ever enjoyed the movie uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you know, you, you probably hear in the back of your mind a, a professor calling the role and saying, Bueller? Bueller? Wehler was a mathematician. His name is pronounced that way. So the Wehlerian cycle is the, uh, this much more efficient way to go navigating around among all these kamers and pull out the contigs one by one. All right, now I appreciate that the math on that one is pretty crazy. I don't want you to think as much about the math on this as, as it is the recognition that inferring a contig, assembling a contig, is in effect finding k mers of sequence that overlap by almost all of the residues from uh, all, almost all of the all but one nucleotide. Stepping from one kmer to the next kmer to the next kmer is the process by which we're going to infer a contig out of these. And the De Bruyne graph gives us the ability to do a relatively efficient algorithm called the Wehlerian cycle finding to do all of these walks because it allows us to do each edge once. I realize that may not be a very satisfactory explanation of what all of this is doing, but if you have in your mind, my goodness, De Bruyne graphs are a good way to do assembly from KMER catalogs. We're really doing very, very well. I'm going to read you an excerpt of paper to show you how dense these are uh, when, once you get to the manuscripts. So, modern short read assembly algorithms construct a De Bruyne graph by representing all KMER prefixes and suffixes. You remember our suffix arrays? It's revisiting us here of all KMER prefixes and suffixes as nodes, and then drawing edges that represent KMERs having a particular prefix and suffix. For example, the KMER edge ATG has the prefix AT and the suffix TG. Finding a Wehlerian cycle allows one to reconstruct the genome by forming an alignment in which each successive KMER, which is that, from successive edges is shifted by one position. These kamers overlap by 24 letters, they're 25 letters long. This generates the same, the same cyclic genome sequence without performing the computationally expensive task of finding a Hamiltonian cycle. Okay? That's a little dry, but if you keep in mind you're trying to step from one kamer to the next that differs by just one nucleotide from the last, you're doing pretty well. De Bruyne graphs make that easy. And with that, we have stepped outside the fine world of genome assembly. So, what good have we done if what came out of the genome project was one sequence for each autosome and one sequence for each of the two sex chromosomes? Just a big sequence. Is that useful? Not yet. You know, your, your ability to make use of information requires more than sequence. And an annotated genome is much more than just a big bunch of sequences. It is an annotated sequence. And the annotation is almost all of the art in a genome project. So the rest of this lecture is all about trying to figure out which bits of that assembled genome is valuable. All right, we are going to start with hidden Markov models. Hidden Markov models are a fairly complex thing to understand, I'm afraid. But uh, I'm going to try to make this argument for you that each object within a hidden Markov model represents some bit of biology. Hidden Markov models are very frequently the very first algorithm that you would run on an assembled sequence. 
because those hidden Markov models comprise the bulk of our gene finders, the things that can find genes within bulk DNA sequence. So here we are looking at a visualization of the gene scan hidden Markov model. We're looking at half of it. I, I would say that there's half of it because the software doesn't know whether the template strand or the complementary strand is the one that we should be looking at to find genes. So I want you to think that all of this is also going on in the reverse direction on the other half of the model shown outside the slide. That's okay. Let's consider this our start point. You see this is called intergenic region. You should be able to see that on your video copies, on your, on your screens a little better. I'm sorry I couldn't make this larger. It's kind of a complex model. Imagine this is our start point. We're just in a bunch of bulk DNA. We're not looking at any particularly interesting gene at this moment in time. The software is going to is going to be sort of triggered out of this sleepy state by hitting a bunch of AT, 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 AT stuff. If it sees a region that's rich in AT, the software is likely to flip over into a promoter state. You've heard of ta, -ta boxes? Ta, ta boxes? Oh, good. All right, so a ta, ta box is an example of a promoter. It's a region that's rich in A's and T's. So the, the hidden Markov model as soon as it starts hitting a bunch of AT, 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 it gets kind of excited about it. It's like, boom, hey, I'm flopping over into promoter mode. Here we have a five prime untranslated region. There, are, I, I couldn't actually tell you what the sequences look like for us to say, ah, we must be in an untranslated region, but they, they do exist. It's possible that we have a, a single exon gene, in which case we hit the open reading frame, and then we're done. We're back out into a three prime untranslated region. Then we have a poly A tail that, uh, that gets thrown in, into this, and then we're right back in the energetic region. That would be a relatively short loop for us to go, a single exon gene. It's possible that instead we have stepped onto an initial exon, and then we get a GT sequence at the end of this exon that suggests to us, ah, we're entering an intron, and then we hit an AG. You may not understand what I'm talking about, so let me, let me say that, generally speaking, our exon boundaries in, in genes have the sequence GTAG, or GTAC, I'm forgetting which one, I'm sorry. So there are certain letters within our nucleotides that are hints that we are stepping out of one exon and into an intron region. All right, so the software has these different mappings that it can use. It can move in and out among all of these different, uh, among these different intron and exon states until it hits something that is an exon final, hits the three prime untranslated region, a poly A region, and slips back into entergenic region. All right, now I feel that a little computer science here is gonna make this a lot clearer. So let me try to do that. A hidden Markov model is a, is a model that involves these different states, a succession of states that the, that the model must move through that, rep, that represent different parts of a sequence feature. For each node in this model, we have something called emission probabilities that say what patterns of letters are most frequent when we're sitting in this node. Those patterns of letters are the sequence itself. We also have transition probabilities. So the probability that we go from a five prime untranslated region back to an intergenic region is zero, right? Because there is no such thing as, an, as a five prime untra uh, untranslated region that goes immediately back to intergenic state. The definition of a 5' prime UTR is something that's next door to a gene, right? So we must move into an exon, whether it's a single exon or an initial exon, if we're doing that. So you might think to yourself, the emission probabilities associated with the promoter here would be heavy on the A and T letters. If you're in a promoter, the bits of sequence you're most likely to see are heavy on A's and T's. It's a ta-ta box, right? Similarly, the initial exon 
is very likely to have a start codon in it, right? A start codon tells you that you're, at the, that, that you're in the part that actually codes for a protein sequence. So you want to see A and G in one of these. So that is an example of another emission probability that is associated with these. Once you're in one of these, uh, once you're in one of these exons, if you've made it into this one, you must transition to an intron unless you're on the final exon. So, in a way, this hidden Markov model being dragged, uh, we're dragging the whole sequence through this Markov model and recording where it goes high, basically. We are able to find locations in the genome that correspond to a structure that has implications in what letters we should see. Do we have that? Okay. Hidden Markov models are very, very useful. They're also very prone to false positives. So there are lots of places. If you, if you look at an annotated genome that you might grab from, say, RefSeq, you'll frequently see that they have an all version of the database that has all of the genes that they think are reliable. And there's also an ab initio uh, version of that database. And typically, the ab initio database is much larger. That's because they haven't screened out all the false positives that result that, that they've dis decided to, to disregard from the hidden Markov models. So gene scan is just one of these, but there's a pile of different algorithms out there that all use hidden Markovs to find these complex features. Okay. Now I've already mentioned the Smith-Waterman aligner, but there's an awful lot more to say about this, this subject. Okay, so we are sitting at three o'clock. I have one more hour for the remainder of these slides. I think I gave myself 34 slides. I talk a lot though, I know. All right, so why should we bother aligning one sequence to another? Number one, recognize orthologs. Do you know the word orthologs? Orthologs is a really important term to know. So uh, orthologs represent the same gene found in multiple species. All right, so if I have a pyruvate kinase and the mouse has a pyruvate kinase, these are orthologs. They, they carry the same function. Evolutionarily, they're derived from the same parent sequence. So that's an ortholog, the same gene in another species. Paralogs, now this is really interesting. You know, your body will occasionally, over the course of eons, our bodies over the course of eons, will find that some genes get duplicated. Right? So we had one copy of this particular enzyme. Now the genome has two. What we find is that, from an evolutionary standpoint, people who get two copies of the gene, eventually one of them is going to die out. That, that, that copy of the, the secondary copy of the other, the secondary copy of the gene is going to go away unless these two genes start drifting in different directions functionally. So for example, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the proteins that we have in our eyes used to be an enzyme. It, well, at least it had a sequence that was very similar to an enzyme. But it began taking on a structural role over the course of millennia. So the, although it was a copy of an enzyme, it didn't continue in the role of an enzyme. It changed to this structural, uh, in t the structural purpose instead. And as a result, our bodies have kept both of them. I believe that's the story for uh, alpha crystalline, if I'm not mistaken. So these, these genes bear similarity to themselves. In this first case, in orthologs, we were talking about relating the gene found in one species to a gene found in another species. But in paralogs, we are looking within one organism and finding the history of gene duplication within that individual, within that organism's species. All right, so gene families is another term that you frequently see used in connection with paralogs. And of course, we would like to recognize conserved regions. Basically, over time, evolution tinkers with everything. But some parts of our DNA are so sensitive to tampering that we find very, very few cases where, that, uh, where those nucleotides have changed. So these can be signatures to us of parts of the sequence that are indispensable, absolutely indispensable. OK, those conserved regions, then, can be very useful for us in understanding the function of genes. 
So at a very high level view of alignment, I want you to think about these three concepts, global versus local. Are we attempting to align a whole sequence to a whole sequence, or are we willing to find best internal matches? This is a big deal because, as, I, as I've mentioned, there are some parts of these sequences that are far better conserved than others, and a local aligner will find them, but a whole, a, a global alignment may miss them because it's in, insisting that this whole sequence must be compared to this other whole sequence. Generally speaking, when you, when you look at something like uh, BLAST, you're talking about a local aligner. Um, that's what the L stands for in, in BLAST, as I recall. Next, do you want the very best match that's, that's possible and, and be able to prove that you've got the very best match? Or are you willing to use a heuristic a heuristic is not guaranteed to give you the best match under this set of rules. But frequently, we can, we can the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. If you wanted to search the entirety of all protein databases ever made and look for any, uh, and look for the absolute best match to some input sequence, you would end up spending a lot of computer cycles and the result might not be that much better than what BLAST could do very, very quickly. Yes? What do you mean by heuristic? A heuristic is a, a, type of, a type of algorithm that does not have a provably correct result. So a, a, we, we think of a, an optimal algorithm as something that has a provably correct result. But a heuristic is doing a lot of hand-waving and it's doing a lot of approximations that speed up the process tremendously but may sacrifice the provably correct result, the provably best result. Good question. Okay. It's not a term that we use all that often. You know, when we think of our software, we're not really asking, does it give the best possible result or does it give a fast result? We frequently have fallen on the, the case of using the faster algorithms rather than the provably correct ones. Okay. Evolutionary distance. If you are looking at very closely related sequences, it probably makes the most sense to compare them on the basis of their DNA or RNA. Comparing at a nucleotide level gives you more detailed information about near-term modifications in sequences. If you are looking at very distant evolutionary relationships, say 10 million years or more, you may want to spend your time thinking about protein sequences instead. And that's because protein sequences change far more gradually than do nucleotide sequences. Okay. On we go. Now, I, I used to teach one whole lecture, a full hour, just about dynamic programming. And I, uh, I realized one slide is not going to get it done. But what I, would, what I would have you say is that when you're using a dynamic programming algorithm, you are using one that solves small parts of the problem and uses that to build up its global answer more quickly, more directly. All right? So we're going to talk about the problem of sequencing in the context of dynamic programming. In this case, I'm using very, very simple rules for an alignment. If the two sequences have the same letter at a position, we give it one point. If it fails to, uh, to find a match between the two, if, if the sequences are not identical at that point, we call it a score of zero. If there are gaps, we're not going to penalize the scoring. All right? So we have this sequence, A-S-L-V-N-D-K, and we have this sequence, A-L-V-N-N, sorry, K-D-K. So you might imagine, then, that we want our A's to line up and our L's to line up and our V's to line up and our N's to line up We've got this problematic K here, though, and then we have DK, that both sequences end in DK, so that's pretty good. Doing an alignment by I, though, can sometimes be really problematic when you've got sequences that are 40 long and that have very low degree of homology to each other. So, uh, we can start by looking at the very last letter of each sequence. Does K match K? Yes, it does. So we can write a 1 right here. What if the last letter of this sequence is not the right, right place to start, though? Maybe we should consider the next to last letter of this 
versus the final letter of that. That's not a match, so we give that a zero. All right, now we can fill in this entire bottom row and this entire side row just using those rules. So we saw that the, sorry, the, the antipenultimate letter here, K, is a match to the last letter of this. So that might be a legitimate place to start our alignment. That's why we have a one here. So we filled in the right edge and the bottom edge of this. From here, things start building on the information we've already produced. So these column, th this column and this row can only tell us about one position versus one position. They're either ones or they're zeros. But from this point, we can start building. Here, it, we're looking at an alignment of this letter versus this one. And we see that D and D are a match. Therefore, we're going to add a one here. But there's some magic. We're able to build off of the one down here to say, oh, if we, uh, if we reach this point, we've aligned the last two letters of this to the last two letters of that. That gets a score of two, because they're both, they're both hits. They're identical. If we go here, com combine, uh, doing our comparison of D to N hasn't helped us at all. We still have our best score of those last letters. This would imply putting a, uh, uh, inserting a gap in between these two letters in any case. So we can build our best result for this next to last alignment off of the first letters that we looked at. So having done this all the way out, I want you to think a little bit about the time it took to fill in the table. We always fill in the rightmost and the bottommost row first, and then we build in the next, then we build in the next. So I want you to think of the length of this sequence as m. So m is 7 here. And the length of this sequence is also 7. All right? That means that we have to do m times n, 49 work, in order to fill this table. If m is bigger, that's OK. But for every increase in m, we're going to get an increase in, in time linearly. And if n is bigger, well, we're going to have an increase in time linear with that. But the time it takes to fill in this table is equal to the product of m and n. That's, that's how we would build this out. So once we get to the very top of the table, we see we have the value of 6. That tells us that the best alignment we can achieve between these two under this set of rules gets a score of 6. How do we interpret that 6, though? We know that this 6 must have been built from a 6 or a 5 or whatever below it. And that 5 below it must be built off of a 4, and the 4 built off of a 3 below it, which built off of a 2, which built off of a 1. If we just have a diagonal that tells us that we've got a 1 for 1 matching for this part of these two sequences. But in some places, we had to add gaps. You see this AL here required us to strike out this S here. So we inserted a gap in this sequence to give us the, the match of this A and L to that A and L. That's what, how we interpret a jump over this column. Over here, we had to jump over this row in order to get us uh, this match from NDK to this NDK, because this K was a problem for that. OK. So that's all I'm going to say at the moment about dynamic programming algorithms. But I, I, these, have, these started as the basis by which alignments were done. And when I mentioned Smith-Waterman in the case of Repeat Masker, I was making reference to an algorithm just like this that allows us to use dynamic programming to find matches for, uh, for, uh, re uh, for repeat sequences against genomic DNA. All right. Now, whew, does everyone need to sort, sort of shake it off for a minute? we kind of got the afternoon torpor. All right. A five-minute break? Five-minute break, hereby invoked. All right, I'm going to, uh, oh, pick up Mr. Thumb um, here. All right. We are continuing our recording. Is uh, everything rolling again? Okay, yeah. bring it. I happen to know that there are a couple quiz questions in the slides about to hit us. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to give you that little clue. For the people who are taking their time getting back from the bathroom, they're just going to miss that bit of information. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> Two probabilities make an odd ratio. It's a very good, uh, very good thing to know. When someone gives you odds ratios, they're comparing two probabilities. Hi there. So, uh, we are going to talk about this in the context of a substitution matrix. And a substitution matrix may sound like something dreadfully dull and boring, but in fact, it is so bloody important in the field of alignment that we must talk about it. And we're going to talk about a, a substitution matrix that was designed from the Blocks database at the University of Washington. Blocks was a, uh, uh, an attempt to find a bunch of sequences that change very, very slowly over evolutionary time. So you can find these hunks of sequence across different species. So one of the things that they wanted to evaluate was how frequently a particular letter of sequence was replaced by another letter of sequence. Now, I happen to love biochemistry. So I would, uh, I would say that there are good reasons in my mind why serine would frequently be replaced by threonine. Does anyone see why? Threonine and serine. Threonine and serine both have hydroxyl side chains. They're the only two that have, well, I'm sorry, there's also tyrosine, I should conclude. But serine and threonine are very, very similar biochemically in how they behave. So you might think, oh, if I see a sequence and S could align with T, that's not all bad. I know the letters aren't identical, but their functions are similar. But instead of starting from biochemical knowledge about the amino acids, they asked over, bio, over evolutionary time frames, which letters have been replaced by others in our database. And they decided to do this through an odds ratio approach expressed in log scale. There's a shorthand for this. We call it a LODS ratio, L-O-D-D-S ratio, which is the comparison of two probabilities on the log scale. Okay, so what they've done is to evaluate two different probabilities for each pair of letters. Maybe the parakeet has a Q at this position and this other sequence has an N, uh, from, from hamster has an N at this position. So we can then ask, what is the, the, uh, the fraction of time that we saw N get replaced by Q compared with the expected probability that that would happen? And as I said, Blossom is giving Laud's ratios. It's giving the, the ratio of two probabilities taken to the log two, all right? So how you interpret a Laud's ratio starts around zero. All right? If you have a Laws ratio of zero, it means that the two probabilities that you are comparing are identical. You can do the math if you work this out. Imagine that you have a probability of 0.45 for your foreground probability, and you have a probability of 0.45 for your background probability. That makes the odds ratio equal to what? One, right, because the foreground and background probabilities are the same thing. 0.45 divided by 0.45 is one. Anything divided by itself is one. So if the two probabilities are equal, the, the ratio is equal to one. But, before you get really excited about that, remember, we are talking about this in a log scale. In a log scale. And the log of one is to say, what, what, what value must we raise to two? What, what exponent must we raise two up to in order to equal one? And that value is zero. Okay, so don't be fooled on that one. A zero is the expected rate. It is to say that the amount of substitution of one amino acid for the other was the same as what we would have expected by random chance alone. So keep that zero very firmly in your mind as we behold the majesty of the Blossom 62 substitution matrix. When you are looking at two sequences and you're trying to figure out which parts of these sequences align well, Blossom 62 is more frequently your answer than anything else you'll see. There are also matrix, uh, a matrix called PAM and different relatives of those uh, that, are, that are used. But Blossom 62 is almost always seen when we're doing long range homology comparisons. So, 
The way to read this is that we have a series of amino acids across the top and a series of amino acids down the side. They're the same order. So you might ask yourself, but wait, evolution happened in one direction. Maybe N was the start and it became Q. Isn't that different than starting at Q and becoming N? But in fact, we don't often have ancestral sequences to work from. So we always just look at the fact that the parakeet has a Q, the hamster has an N. We don't know which of those sequences was ancestral. So this, so this, this matrix that we're looking at is symmetric. Across this, across this diagonal. Now, why have I colored in gray the diagonal of the Blossom 62 matrix? Let's look at this uppermost. Why is this value in gray? The lines of the other A. It reflects an A being replaced with A. Okay, so. Uh, the that, so the, the rate at which we see A replaced by A through evolution here is given yeah, as 4. So when you have identity between two sequences, the scores that get attributed to that match are all found along this diagonal. So you might look at this quickly and say, ah, W getting replaced by W is really important. That happening by random chance? is not so likely. But for a W to be conserved, that's a really big suggestion that this alignment is real. Okay, so what is the, what is the point at which we say that these odds ratios um, balance, that, that are the, the amount of change that we saw was exactly what we would have expected by random chance? Zero, right. So. Here we see that an event like an N being replaced by a Q doesn't happen any more often than we would have expected by random chance. I mentioned S and T, so here's S, that's T. And we see that the value in Blossom for an S being replaced by a T is one. So I'm gonna ask you, how do we decode the value of one on a lots ratio where you've got a base of two? This is a log base 2 ratio. The way that we would read it is to say that S is replaced by T twofold as much as we would have expected by random chance. Whereas something like this, this is isoleucine getting replaced by leucine, happens 2 to the second times as much as you would expect by random chance. So 4 times as much. Uh, something like this. Here's valine, here's uh, isoleucine. We see that isoleucine gets replaced by valine two to the third, eight times, as frequently as you would expect by random chance. This is a laws scoring table that we can use to score alignments. When we were looking at the dynamic programming algorithm back there, I said that if they're identical, I score them as one, and if they're not identical, I score them as zero. Well, that's obviously a crap scoring system. We need a scoring system that takes into account the evolutionary relationships among amino acids. That's what Blossom 62 represents. So how, in effect, uh, does this play out? Here I have two sequences, Rega and Yiddick. And you can see that it, in this alignment, I have the, they don't look very similar, do they? I mean, if you just glance at that, does that look like a pair of similar sequences? Not so much. But there's some things. We've got an ET that line up here. We have G, K, Y, P right here. There's something to say that this is a real alignment. So here's how this works. We have an R and a Y. Do we know which of those was older from an evolutionary perspective? No, we don't. But in this case, we don't care. We simply look for R here, and we keep tracing down until we find Y, which is right here. R versus Y is a minus 2. We write that in the middle. E versus D. Well, now, if you just look at that, you might think, well, this is a spartic acid and glutamic acid, two carboxy acids. That's probably a good score. So we can come over to E, roll down to D, and we see, aha, that happens twice as often as you would expect by random chance. Write in a plus 2. You can do that for each pair of letters across here. And then you just sum them up. You just sum them up. What a wild concept. 
So these, uh, these laws ratios, when they're very high, help to, to steer us towards saying, oh yeah, that, that's a real thing. But you can invoke some negatives. Here we've got histidine versus isoleucine. Those are very different biochemically. It scores a minus three. This happens one-eighth as often as you would expect by random chance. That means evolution doesn't like it very much. But in, in aggregate, we get, a, we get a score that evaluates the totality of the sequence alignment, not just one position. All right, gaps. Now, gaps are really kind of challenging to deal with. I'm not going to say a whole lot about them. But I would note that gap penalties are one of these things that really separate how these algorithms compute their alignments. In general, you will see that people use, oh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name, is it, is it called an affine gap approach? You score a penalty just for creating a gap, and then every time you build out an extra character within it, you have another penalty that you apply for making the gap bigger. So small gaps are considered less painful than large gaps. Okay, so when you're using Blossom 62, one way to do this is to charge five against the alignment if you have to open a gap, and then you charge another three for every letter you add. So these are, these are the approaches that we use for scoring the alignments that we make. I mentioned M and N earlier when I was talking about the, uh, the dynamic programming approach to creating an alignment. And I want to talk about a little computer science concept that shows up. Yes? Sorry, you said you charge Five and you charge it, so would that be like a minus five and a minus three? Uh, right, yes, that's great. Yeah, so uh, a minus five is a pretty bad penalty, frankly. Uh, you, I don't think, I'm not seeing any of these. There's a minus four here. So if you have a proline and you shove a tryptophan in, you get a minus four penalty. So opening a gap is already worse than any of these uh, pairwise comparisons. I don't think there's a minus five anywhere. Yeah, pretty sure. So, yeah, that's true. So is it minus 5 and then plus 3? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, making the... Every extra amino acid that you add to the gap, you add another... Uh, you, sorry, you subtract another 3 from the score. Like for one extension, you minus 8. Yes, that, that's a, that's a two-letter gap, yeah. Okay. So, big O notation is another concept from computer science that shows up very, very frequently in bioinformatics. Part of that is because the data sets we're dealing with now in, in bioinformatics are so large that we really do need very efficient ways to make sense of them. Big O notation is one of those ways that we use to describe it. If you encounter one in the literature when you're trying to decide about algorithms you might use, I would like you to be able to decode what they're talking about. That's why I'm introducing that concept. So sometimes you'll see something that runs in the log of the data size. So if you give it 53, uh, a, a, a 53 large data set or a 503 data set, you can see how much the time rises as a function of that. So log base 2 of n, for example, is a, a big O notation that we would use to describe something that grows with the log of the data size that you throw it. Um, one example of this is binary search. We talked about the problem where I, I lined up everybody by height and tried to find somebody who was exactly five foot four. An example like that cuts, is a very scalable approach because if I have a thousand people versus a hundred people, I don't have to spend ten times as much work to get to that person. So that's an example of a search that scales with the log of how many people I've got in the room. Okay? A linear algorithm is one that grows linearly with the size of the problem. So if the time required to find the person I was looking for increased by tenfold when I stepped from 100 to 1,000 people, we would be growing linearly with the size of the, the problem that I was trying to solve. This is a really great outcome. Generally speaking, if we can, if we can grow at linear or even better log linear uh, growth, spe growth speeds, we're dealing with a very, very efficient algorithm. Now, what if you have uh, two vectors and you want to multiply each item in one vector against every other item in B. Something like that is, it creates this sort of square like we had on the dynamic programming, the, the rectangle. And that is something where we grow as a function of the product of the two input sizes. So that's a big O of MN. 
Sometimes we have algorithms that are exponential. These particularly show up when you run into problems like, uh, uh, like graph theoretical problems. Things like that are just renowned for producing uh, exponential scaling times, which means that the amount of time required for the algorithm to run rises with the, the data size as the power. That's really terrible because you're going to be waiting a really bloody long time for this stuff to finish. Exponential run times are the kinds of software you really want to avoid, if at all possible. All right, this brings us to BLAST. BLAST is probably the most important algorithm that has, that has put bioinformatics on the map. And I want everybody to understand it. As of 2017, there were 127,000 citations to the two major papers of this, uh, of this report. So BLAST is a heuristic, heuristic, meaning that it doesn't guarantee the right answer. It will attempt to give you a very good answer, and it will do so very, very efficiently. And that's why people use it, because it gives such good answers so quickly. So its goal is, is built in an approximation. The argument is that if you have two sequences that are similar, so similar that they're going to produce a good hit, somewhere within those sequences, there should be some amount of identical matching. That's called a seed match. And that seed match is a really important concept to understanding it. Unless there is some degree of identity in the, in the uh, two sequences to be compared, BLAST will not return it as a similar sequence. So you should be aware of that. These are called seed matches. They're produced through something called a finite state machine. We're going to explain it more quickly than I would like. I'm sorry. It's a lot of fun. Then, these seeds can be used as a guide to finding regions that are called maximal segment pairs. And a maximal segment pair is that region between these two sequences that maximizes the score that comes back. The bit score was one we were looking at. So that's a score associated with this maximal segment constructed from, expanded from, these seed matches. All right. And then finally, we're going to look at the scores that were unlikely to have happened by chance alone. We must evaluate that best hit against the database. We saw this this morning. And the expectation value is the way in which it does that. So the expectation value is hugely important. It is the number of different alignments with scores equivalent to or better than S, this being the best score you got, that are expected to occur in a database search by chance. A lower E value means that this score is even less likely to have shown up by random chance. Right? So, if you have a high E value, like say a value of 1, you throw that thing away. 1 is terrible on expectation value. That means that this score is just about as high as you would have expected to have seen by random chance. That's not a good hit. You want low, low E values. Okay, on we go. Finite state machines. I find this subject so, so interesting. I really wish I'd taken this as a computer science course. I didn't, sadly, so I must... I must limit my discussion to some extent. How can you find all three-letter matches between some query sequence and the database? How can you do that? We want to make one pass through the sequence database that allows us to find all possible three-letter matches from our query sequence. Weird, huh? How do we do that? So, this is a root node. I'm building a tree from this. So this is the starting point for any arbitrary sequence. From this, we want to create a machine that represents all different three-letter combinations drawn from this input sequence. So it's pretty obvious that the first one is KSS, right? That's, that's the first three-mer that we can pull from this. Next, we have SSG, SGS, GSS, SSY, SYP, YPS. Anyone see any other three-letter combos I missed? I don't. Just, just three consecutive letters. So, in this case, we want to create one tree that represents all of these sequences. So, KSS is represented right here. KSS. Are there any other three-mers that start with K in that input sequence? Right, that's why K isn't branched here. There's just KSS built right off of it. Next, SSG shows up here. SSG. 
Are there other sequences that also start with S? There are. So SGS is there as well. Here we see it's built in right there alongside the tree. And we have SSY. SSY. Oh, I hope it's a good call. <laughs> ah, all right. SSY is one. SYP is right here. That's the last one. So this is our way of representing all three MERS in this sequence. The really amazing thing is that this data structure allows us to pass the entire sequence database through it in order to determine any matches to any three MER. That may not make a lot of sense, but it's true. This is called a, a, a dictionary algorithm or a, an ahocoracic tree traversal, if you like, but that doesn't much matter. As we pass through here, we're going to ask ourselves three questions. What's going on with this letter? What's going on with the letter that we looked at last time? And what's, looking, what's going on with the letter that we looked at two times ago? So at TLL, we ask, can we go, can we, uh, sorry, when we're sitting at the T, we say, can I enter this tree by going to a T? Seeing a big head shake. No, there's no T here. So our pointer here just goes away. Next. When we're at the L, can we enter this tree? Nope. When we hit this L, can we? Nope. At the A, can we hit it? Nope. How about the Y? We can. All right. So one of our pointers has entered the tree, and it's in a little orbit right here past this Y. Now we're going to hit the next letter. Two things are happening simultaneously. We still have a pointer on this tree right here. So when we hit this next letter, we ask, can we move from the move this node that's currently sitting on the Y to an N? Nope, it dies. Can we enter the tree at the top with an N? Nope. Alright, next up. I'm gonna scoot us all the way up to here at the A. Alright, nothing's sitting on the tree at the moment. Can I enter this tree on an A? Nope. Can I enter this tree on an S? I can. So now I have a pointer sitting at this S. In the next letter, we have to do two things at once. We ask, can I go from the S to a G? We can. It's over there. Oh my goodness, I'm getting too, a, a little stretched here. Can I enter the tree on a G? I can. I have another pointer sitting here. So now, we hit the S. Can the, the one that's sitting on this G go to an S? Yes, it can. Bing, 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 a ringer goes off, the computer goes freaky crazy, and it says, my lord, there is a three-letter match between these two sequences. At the same time, the, uh, let me see, we had one sitting on the G. G. Can it move on? It can. All right. And we have another one that's entering the tree. It goes to the S. So you can see we've got this sort of cascading position moving through this tree finding every possible Threamer within our query sequence as we do one pass through the sequence database. Only those sequences that match a seed are going to make it into the final round. If they fail to have a seed match, they are ignored. All right. Now, we have seed matches here. RPE was a hit when we did this search. MCT was also a hit. You frequently find that in high-scoring matches, you have multiple seed matches to work from. So what we need to do is figure out how many amino acids we can include around these to improve the score of the hit. Is it possible to worsen the score of the hit by extending out inappropriately? The, the answer to this question is, are there any negative values in a blossom matrix? Yes, there were. There are some letters that are punishing to include rather than to include. To, sorry, that, that, that are better to exclude than to include. So we're going to be very zealous about protecting our score. We want to see it rise, but we don't want to see it fall more than it must. So they're, they're, we're going to extend until we see that we're really hurting ourselves by doing so. So from this, from these seed matches, these two big blocks, we add some similar residues here. A versus V, yeah, that's okay. E versus D, that's good, we like it. A versus V, we already said that was okay. S versus A, eh, that's similar enough, we'll take it, yes. 
K versus H, still good, they're both basic. E versus D, both acidic, I'm pretty happy with that. N versus N, who isn't down for N versus N, you know? That's a good, that's a very positive score. Identity is always a good thing to boost our scores. But look over here, you got a proline versus arginine. Well, that's gonna be kind of negative, I'm afraid to say. This T versus E, not very good. Proline with anything other than proline, we're not happy, right? So the software is going to extend out as far as it can by, to boost its score, but it's going to be cautious about extending into regions that diminish its score. All right, these create, the, this extended region or built around the seed matches is called a maximal segment pair. And as we saw visualized this morning, that maximal segment pair produces an alignment and it produces a score that you can be used, that, that can be used to evaluate the quality of the match. So, having done that, what happens when you've got more than two sequences to compare? For that, we need something like multiple sequence alignment. So, FASTA and BLAST are great when you have one query, but you want to look against a whole database. But multiple sequence alignment is trying to do all pairwise combinations out of a set of sequences that you've provided. So, when these sequences uh, that are most similar to each other are most closely related in evolutionary time, you can use this to reconstruct a phylogeny. How are these sequences similar to each other? Which, which sequences are most similar out of a set? That's useful for producing a phylogeny. Uh, it also is very useful in highlighting those residues within the sequence that are most conserved, where evolution has not uh, introduced a variation that, uh, uh, without being able to harm function, uh, without harming function at the same time. Clustal W is one of these algorithms we use very frequently for multiple sequence alignment. Its goal is to do uh, sort of a, to solve a bit of the handshake problem. When you have a party with n people present at the party, how many different handshakes are there? You can't shake your own hand, and if A shakes B's hand, B has also shaken A's hand. This is the same problem as, as we are dealing with in sequences. We have n sequences, so how many possible pairwise comparisons are there? It's n times n minus 1 divided by 2. It's the same answer for how many different handshakes you can get at a cocktail party. So we need to do alignment of each of these sequences against each other alignment in the, in the set. From that, we construct a guide tree that tells us what order we want to merge these sequences in. And then we can progressively align sequences together or align sequences with alignments themselves to create bigger alignments. I realize I'm kind of rocketing through here. What's that? N times N minus 2. N times, N times quantity N minus 1. So if you have five people in a room, uh, five times four, is 20 divided by 2 is 10. So five people in a room can have 10 different handshakes. If you have six people in a room, it's 6 times 5 divided by 2. So that's 15 uh, different handshakes in a room. So the, the number of handshakes that's possible in a room rises, roughly speaking, with the square of the people that are present. But not exactly, because as I said, you can't shake your own hand. So that was n times the quantity, n minus 1, n quantity, divided by 2. Yeah. I ended up talking about that a lot in classes, so I, I'm never sure if I've already repeated myself on it. OK. So in comparing all of these different species, I am using the pyruvate kinase proteins. Pyruvate kinase is one of these met metabolic enzymes that's been around since forever. So I can compare each pair of of sequences and ask what is the uh, what is the alignment score that I can achieve with them. This tells me the order in which I should join them together in order to produce my multiple sequence alignment. Multiple sequen uh, sequence alignment algorithms are almost always heuristics. That's a very important thing to know because sometimes an expert can look at these alignments that are produced by software and see all kinds of ways in which they could be improved where the, the uh, the heuristic that was at the heart of the multiple sequence alignment algorithm failed to produce an optimal alignment. Okay, so here, what are the two sequences that are most similar to each other out of this matrix? Yeah. 
Pompey. I can never remember if this is the orangutan or the chimp. I should know this off the top of my head. Uh, sorry. Well, here we see that these two sequences are most similar. Yes, two primates are much more similar to each other than any of these others. So this is uh, baker's yeast. Aspergillus is a kind of commercially important fungus. Methanococcus genasii is an archaean. Uh, Bacillus pylorus is a bacteria. Bacterium, uh, of course, we know E. coli. This is Ricinus communis. This is the uh, <laughs> this is the uh, uh, the castor bean, which is what you get ricin from, of all things. Uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, Drosophila melanogaster, fruit fly. All of these organisms have pyruvate kinase, so we can use this to reconstruct a genetic tree spanning all of these these critters. Okay, so if you ever need to do this, CLEFSTYLEW is available on all kinds of public web servers out there. You can hand it a, Pi, a, a FASTA database that you've constructed that has all the sequences you find interesting in it, and it will tell you, it'll attempt to recapitulate the phylogeny that relates them all. Easily used. All right. This is a theme that, again, we're going to be repeating as we get into next week on Monday. But I really wanted to hit it nice and firmly right now so that everybody gets it very squarely in their minds. There is a, li a relationship between sequence and structure and function. And everybody should be very, very clear on how it operates. Some people have called this the, uh, the uh, central dogma of structural biology. And I, I, I think everybody should have this in their minds very firmly. So I have some sequence. This is going to be a protein sequence. We'll just call it a protein sequence. From this sequence, I can learn something about what fold this thing is likely to adopt. I can probably figure out where some alpha helices are. I can probably figure out where some beta sheets are. And from that, I can probably get a fold that shows me the approximate structure that is likely to happen. This is a process in biology of energy minimization. We have this sort of slope that these, these uh, these molecules go through as they're folding into the form that they're going to take on. That means that they have a structure that results from them. The structure of a protein very, very frequently is a, is a clear pointer to what is the function of this, of this protein. That's not just true for proteins. It's true for all kinds of molecules. But the, I want you to keep in mind that if you can find things that share a common sequence, there's the implication that those regions of sequence carry out, fold into the same structures. And if they fold into the same structures, we infer that they have the same function. Is it to say that if I see the same sequence appearing again and again, it always has the same function? Not quite. It doesn't work quite as strongly as that. But we do say that when sequences have very similar sequences, Sorry, when, when two molecules have the same sequence, we say that they're going to have similar structures. If they have similar structures, again, we're going to infer that they have similar functions. So sequence motifs are what we usually refer to when we're talking about one of these regions of conserved sequences. So if I say motif, I'm usually talking about a sequence. A domain is a sub-element of structure that we're talking about. So if we, if we know that there's a self-stabilizing region of protein that adopts this particular subfold, we call it a domain. And then a protein family is working at this much larger level to say that this set of proteins have similar functions, essentially. OK. So from that, we get to position-specific scoring matrices. You remember I was talking about logs ratios just a few minutes ago. Those are going to reapply here. I was also talking about HMMs. Does anyone remember what an HMM was? Hidden Markov model. Exactly, yeah. It's a hidden Markov model. I was showing you an example of a gene finder called GeneScan that was built around a hidden Markov model. So I want you to think of position-specific scoring matrices as another kind of example of a hidden Markov model. All right. So I'm going to try to just show you did I include an example of this? I didn't. How terrible. Oh, wow. Well, I skipped over a slide. Sorry. Um, so you might imagine that if I have 20 different sequences that all contain the same motif, they have this region of sequence 
that aligns really well among that set. And that is a motif that we can then characterize as a PSSM because the position-specific scoring matrix is going to tell us how frequently we find each letter at each position within this matrix that we've made of the aligned sequences. So this is one of the ways that we can define a motif in a position-specific scoring matrix. Now that's obviously a lot of syllables. What you frequently hear them called is possum. I grew up in the Midwest, that's very exciting to me because possums are everywhere and they stink and they growl at you and they're, they're not a lot of fun. It's the North American marsupial for crying out loud, you should, like the, you should like the fact that we have marsupials at all. But possums, I mean you find them around your dumpster, they're just not great animals. But possum in this case is a way that you can recognize a sequence motif, that you can characterize it and score new sequences against this family of conserved sequences. Okay. So. There are two general ways that you see these used. One of these is that you might simply store the, the composition that we see at a particular location, uh, at a particular column within this alignment. You've got a whole stack of these sequences. They've all been aligned together. And at this position, I see S, 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 T, T, Y. And so I ask myself, what is, the, what is the most common outcome here? What is the second most common outcome, and so on? And I can say, what is the probability that I would see, if, if, if I did have a sequence of this, that I should see an S, a T, a Y, or other sequence at this location? For that, you can, you can uh, use a multinomial scoring distribution to, to deal with that. But you might instead go the log odds route. We already talked about log odds tables when we talked about Blossom. We're comparing two probabilities. Um, you know, if this were a sequence of this type, it would have this probability of this letter at this position. If it were a sequence drawn at random from the database that had nothing to do with this motif, what's the probability it would have this letter there? So now you can have this sort of this strength versus weakness thing. You can say, what is the probability that this sequence uh, that this sequence comes from this family based on the letters that it has across this motif? I should include a visualization of this, though. I will try to get that in the next version of these slides. <clears throat> Trying to dig through the great universe of motif finders that's out there can take a lot of time. And the folks at European Bioinformatics Institute thought that it would be really good to try to unify all of these different motif finders that are out there. I've got four minutes. I'm going to use them. All right, so. They thought to themselves, lots of people have written motif finders, but no one wants to learn 15 different user interfaces to tie them all together. So uh, actually, one of, the, one of the best computational biologists in South Africa uh, is one of the researchers who was behind the creation of Interpro. Uh, so Nikki Mulder over at University of Cape Town was one of the, the, inspire, uh, one of the, the forces that helped to organize all of this. They found that some of the tools would recognize motifs by regexes. Do you remember regexes from this morning? We talked about a pattern finder that looked for characters only at the start of a line. That was an example of a regex, a regular expression. Some of them use possums, as I just mentioned, these position-specific scoring matrices. Some of them use clustering. A fair number of them use hidden Markov models for finding these. Uniprot makes it possible to use all of those through one user interface. So if you have a protein sequence and you've got no freaking clue what this thing is supposed to do or what parts of that sequence are important, Interproscan is your best friend. The URL for it is right here. That 2009 is not when it was initially published. That's just a follow-on article to talk about the more current status of the software. A protein that I find very fascinating is ricin. This is uh, because I was involved in, uh, as a defense witness in some trials in the United States for people who were accused of sending ricin to politicians. It's not a very popular role to be uh, defending them, but in fact, people deserve fair trials. So ricin is a really bloody dangerous protein, and castor bean plants are, you, are ridiculously common. They're used for landscaping all over the United States, so anybody can get their hands on these seeds. It's just a few demented people out there who try then to refine ricin from it to kill people, right? So ricin has two kind of wild uh, aspects to it. It has a ribosome inactivating protein. 
They call this the RIP domain. Isn't that rockin' awesome? <laughs> it's like calling a protein pirate or something, you know? So the RIP domain. This is a part that if it touches your ribosome, bam, dead ribosome, okay? It also has what I call the door knocker. It's a lectin. Does anyone know what a lectin is good for? A protein that's good for finding a particular sugar. If it finds that sugar, it attaches to it. So what happens, this is one protein, right? This is not a virus, it's not a microorganism. It's a single protein. This protein comes up to your cell and says, hey, sugar. <laughs> Grabs the sugar, boom, it's in the cell, bam, dead ribosome. Just like that. Okay, so you can see these structural elements as represented by Interpro here. This is where the, the current URL is. They've changed their user interface quite a lot since the last time I made this slide, so I figured it was time for an update. So you can see that the entire protein stretches 576 amino acids. It has uh, hits from Profan and SS. I can't remember which one that is off the top of my head. But it also has hits to Procyte, which is an algorithm that's useful for, for spotting these things. And you see that these different regions all map to the RIP. So this, is a, this final one comes from the, G, uh, uh, the G3D, which is a, a way to uh, recognize structural features on the basis of sequence. So all of these things get hits on this RIP domain. And we similarly see that all four of these engines get hits on the lectin domain as well. So when you have a protein sequence and you want to know what some part of it is doing, Interproscan is a very, very powerful tool for that purpose. We made it to the final slide. Aligning sequences was the original killer app of bioinformatics. It put us on the map and said, you can accomplish more biology because sequence alignment exists. That was very powerful. Multiple sequence alignment is quite approximate. You are not guaranteed an optimal result when you use these heuristics, but that does not mean that they're not useful. Sequence motifs are useful tools when you're trying to discern what the functionality is of a particular sequence. And yes, you can run things like Interproscan on a full database of sequences. It can take months of time, I'll say that, but it's a, it's a very powerful piece of software. All right, and with that, we have come to the end of today's lecture. I realize it was a bit of a marathon. I'm, I, I congratulate you for hanging on. Tomorrow is Friday. We start the quiz at 9.30. 9.30. We will still be right here in this very room. So I look forward to seeing your faces tomorrow. Thank you.